Welcome to the second day of the Bertalanffi event this year. And as yesterday, it's my great pleasure to introduce Angela Nieto from Alicante. And Angela is going to tell us about, well, epithelial mesenchymal transition in the widest sense. But before we go into the science, a few words of introduction. Angela did her PhD in Madrid, working on an entirely different topic. After that PhD, she did a first postdoc in Madrid, a second very short postdoc at the Max Planck in, in Martin Street, before she moved to the National Institute for Medical Research, Mill Hill, where she basically discovered what kept her busy up, up to now. And uh, this was um, a transcription factor that is crucial for this mesenchymal, epithelial mesenchymal transition. And after her postdoc, she moved back to Spain, initially Madrid, the Cajal Institute, where she was immediately getting a, a junior group with a permanent position, something that is extremely rare. And from there, another maybe unusual step, she decided to move to Alicante that before that was probably mainly known to the tourists. Uh, but now it's, it's really one of the light towers for research, in particular, well, neuro research, uh, which is uh, done in the institute that she's now actively been pushing forward. And it's a, it's a joint institution because between a research, the Center of Research um, Agency in Spain and the university there. And well, it's not only science that she's pushing, it, it's also science policies. Uh, just to, to name one thing, she's been serving the EMBL EMBO Council and has been serving there as vice chair and, and many, many other things. Among for me, the most impressive is, is the prize of the Spanish king was actually not only handing over, shaking her hand and exchanging things. That, that's quite special and impossible in Germany in the absence of a king. In the absence of a king, exactly. So I'm very glad that, well, that we managed to attract her here and that she will talk about not science politics, but actual science and cell plasticity trajectories in development and disease. Special Thank pleasure. You. Thanks for being here. And we're very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jochen. Um, so um, hello again for many of you that uh, you know, are very grateful that you decided to come back after my talk yesterday. <laughs> Uh, so you never know. You know. Um, anyway, thank you very much for being here. It's my real pleasure. Um, and it's also really very nice to see, you know, so many people for a, for a, for a talk, you know. This means a lot, and this tells a lot about the Institute. So I knew that, and I told you yesterday, but now I can confirm that, you know, I'm really very happy here, feel like home. And uh, the atmosphere here is really amazing, both in terms of science and in terms of, uh, you know, social relationships, so it's really beautiful. Um, yes, so today I will tell you um, more about science. I yesterday also mentioned, you know, how I was, you know, sort of um, sort of making decisions in science, and I was also talking a bit about science, but today I would like to tell you about uh, particularly one project that we have been working on for Few, quite a few years already is uh, for me very interesting, and I hope you also like it. Um, of course, I'm not referring to the epithelial to mesenchymal transition because this is the subject of the last 30 years, but a particular aspect of, of that, which um, I, I really like. Um, but indeed, you know, the first thing is actually introducing the project that I'm sh the project the, the uh, process which, uh, of course, I understand that uh, many of you are familiar with, and uh, we um, still enjoy it after 30 years working on it, which is this uh, phenotypic conversion of epithelial cells into mesenchymal cells that you can actually even see in culture just making epithelial cells to express one particular uh, factor. Uh, and uh, you see that from being almost in motile cells are converted into even individual entities that can migrate and can not only migrate but also invade and therefore, um, you know, be sort of digesting the extracellular matrix and, uh, you know, find their way to different destinations. Um, 
True, you know, the first um, uh, ENT transcription factor I, I, I was lucky to, to isolate was snail. The snail was already known in Drosophila, but we uh, could show that it is a very important uh, inducer of this process. But with the time and with many labs uh, working in this subject, now we know that there are many EMT inducing transcription factors. They are, they are all, well, belonging to different families. So snail and SEP uh, and the twist and PRX, all of them have different, uh, you know, several members. And all of them are actually able to induce this process in epithelial cells. Today I will not get to that, but just because I think it is an important concept, the um, cellular behavior after undergoing EMT induced by these different factors is not the same. So th there are many different types of EMT induced by the different factors. But what it is important is to understand that this process is quite widespread uh, in different contexts. Of course, obviously, in development. In development, uh, the neural crest that I alluded to yesterday and also the formation of the mesoderm are the sort of prototypical uh, tissues in which, or cells in which this process uh, is activated and crucial for development. But there are many other developmental processes that uh, concur with the activation of the EMT. Then, again, in, uh, in homeostasis, uh, they are really very important for wound healing. And I believe that this is maybe one of the subfields that is now growing uh, really very much because it is, uh, you know, becoming extremely important. The pathological side, um, again, I mentioned that yesterday, uh, when this process is reactivated in a sort of a aberrant manner, uh, it leads to a lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, this, I mean, not, not, not many, but actually a big impact into diseases, including cancer that I briefly mentioned yesterday, but also fibrosis. And I will uh, tell you a bit more about it, not very much, because I would like to mainly concentrate on, on um, you know, how this impacts into cancer evolution. But nevertheless, you will see also that. And um, I did not mention yesterday, but it's also an important point that uh, more recently the EMT has also been associated with the acquisition of stem cell properties. And this is also very important because we are dealing with, again, plasticity between differentiation and de-differentiation. And this is uh, also very important for uh, the uh, progression of uh, different diseases. So just uh, to uh, sort of put it in frame, as uh, similar to, to, to yesterday, the EMT was fixed in evolution for cells that are you know, born uh, very far from their final destination when they have to uh, um, do their function. And, and therefore, uh, the uh, acquisition of uh, the capacity to migrate and cell movements by themselves is very important. Uh, also important to, to, to realize which, with the exception of the anterior central nervous system and the epidermis, all uh, cells, um, you, know, you know, tissues and organs derive from cells that, un that have undergone at least one round of EMT. And I say round because this process is usually reversible. It is um, transient and, uh, you know, when cells reach their destination, they are, you know, the, the, the process is down-regulated, is silent so that the cells can sort of, sort of stop and, and, and colonize. And uh, is, again, as I said, reactivated in different pathological contexts. So um, you will also recognize and be familiar with this as a slide that I also showed yesterday. So we have um, you know, a lot of similarities in the plasticity processes that occur during embryonic development and also in cancer. And essentially what you have here is how cells that are epithelial cells and you know, quite um, immotile, they can undergo um, this process of a, you know, transition towards a mesenchymal state. So they can delaminate and migrate, and then you know, they are yellow in the scheme, the ones that are migrating, and then they become blue again, indicating only that they, the, you know, they um, silence the program and they become epithelial again to now um, uh, generate different tissues. And this is again, you know, has parallels in cancer progression. So if you consider the primary tumor and how cells from the primary tumor will uh, start and, and follow the, the metastatic cascade after 
intravasation, extravasation, very few cells can actually survive. And um, this is to say that metast metastasis formation is a very unlikely event. Uh, nevertheless, and unfortunately, of course, it happens. So the cells that can survive in the bloodstream and then are able to extravasate and reach different uh, organs, then they need to, to, uh, to, to, to accommodate and uh, be able to survive and proliferate in the, in the metastatic niche in different organs and then make um, metastasis as well. So I, I told you yesterday that uh, the EMT uh, favors invasion, therefore it favors dissemination, but it's actually not enough to make metastasis because uh, a non-plastic, a stable EMT, meaning stable mesenchymal phenotype, would not make metastasis. So we found that uh, by uh, studying particular EMT transcription factors, other labs also found the same thing for other factors, and essentially this is the concept now. So remember, as in the embryo, epithelial, mesenchymal, and epithelial again. Importantly, um, and I will go uh, on to that now, uh, this is not a binary process, and we will have a lot of different uh, you know, transitory states uh, in between. But of course, this uh, really has uh, <clears throat> you know, an impact on to our thinking uh, about, uh, you know, how can we um, um, uh, use uh, this knowledge to be sort of uh, useful in terms of designing anti-metastatic therapies. Just to remind you, I mentioned that yesterday, so at the beginning we thought, okay, very good, so we will inhibit EMT and therefore we will not have metastasis. We will usually be late. Uh, patients um, have tumor circulating cells uh, from very early stages, actually at the time of diagnosis. Therefore, we don't want to stop the cells that are already traveling, but rather we want to prevent the colonization of those cells in the metastatic niche. And I uh, already alluded to, uh, you know, uh, sort of a complexity in the phenotypes. Again, you know, this is not a binary process. You don't find an epithelial or a mesenchymal cell. There are, you know, intermediate states in which cells can express both epithelial and mesenchymal markers. They activate both the repression of the epithelial character and the activation of the mesenchymal, uh, the mesenchymal traits. And you can find cells in this sort of hybrid, intermediate, uh, partial EMT state. And this has a lot of, uh, you know, it's very important uh, in, in, in health and disease. So if you look at these two movies, um, on the left we have a cheek castrulation. The cells um, you know, migrate towards the midline, the primitive streak, and then they ingress and uh, you know, they migrate in the uh, medial lateral and anterior posterior axis to find their destinations. And many of these cells seem to be actually doing that in a sort of an individual cells that you can see there. However, if you look at the other movie, which is the migration of the neural crest in the zebrafish embryo, and this movie is actually from Roberto Mayor's lab, you can see that the cells are mesenchymal. You know, they, they actually have lost apicobasal polarity. They have decreased very much the cells to cell addition molecules, but still then migrate in a coordinated manner. So they, um, you know, they maintain transient contacts, and this means that they are not uh, you know, fully mesenchymal cells. But they uh, have advantages, because you know, migrating together um, for cells is important because it helps directionality due to the community effects. And also, uh, remember these transient uh, processes, you know, the, the reversibility. Uh, if the cells are not fully mesenchymal, they are much more prone to be sort of, uh, you know, plastic, and then they can be, um, you know, mm, reverting to a, to a sort of a state that is still compatible with colonization and the formation of different uh, structures that would be organs in the embryo or could be metastasis in, in cancer. So what is the situation in cancer in, in just a summary slide? Um, the difference between this, this scheme that I showed you here and the previous one is that it, now, in addition to individual cells, you, we, you can see clusters of uh, cancer cells delaminating from the primary tumor. And clusters of cells intravasating, surviving in the bloodstream, and extravasating. So these are these cells that are not individual cells, they are not fully mesenchymal, but still they are invasive. So they can 
uh, leave the tumor and they can find their way, but they are going together that helps them to, to, to survive on one hand and also to revert to this blue state in which they can make metastasis. So we know that this happens. And also something that was very interesting to see is that um, in early days, we used to think, I mean, as a field, that only individual cells could traverse capillaries. And therefore, you know, the full EMP was considered to be important for that. But now we know, due to the, you know, the, the, the work of uh, different labs, that um, the cells that are you know, in the bloodstream or even intravasating as clusters have more metastatic potential due to the, you know, to the properties that I mentioned before. And if we uh, now see what happens in, in not only in animal models, but also in, 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 uh, in patients, uh, this sort of uh, state, you know, the partial EMT state um, phenotypes have been already found in different, in different primary tumors, you know, in breast, skin, pancreatic carcinoma. And again, like, you know, the, in the model um, uh, studies done uh, for the, uh, the clusters of tumor cells, these, um, you know, partial EMT phenotypes in which the cells can migrate and be together uh, have um, um, an increased metastatic, metastatic potential. So, um, so now, um, is there any other context, in pathological context, in which the EMT is activated? So the answer to this question is, is obviously yes. I sort of anticipated it yesterday. But in addition to cancer, the EMT is also activated in other, in other pathologies. And uh, one that is uh, very prevalent is organ fibrosis. So organ fibrosis can occur in all internal organs. We have uh, particularly looking have been looking at that in, uh, in the kidneys of renal fibrosis. But uh, these sort of uh, you know, concepts can be extrapolated to other fibrosis like liver fibrosis or lung fibrosis. So it's sort of a, a general mechanism. And um, studying fibrosis is important because, I mean, I'm just now concentrating on the kidney, but as I said, you can sort of extrapolate a bit to other organs, is the main cause of uh, renal failure. And it, it can occur under many, you know, different circumstances. So uh, that includes, you know, urinary obstruction, which is, you know, somehow you common in the, in the aging population, uh, and to moon diseases, diabetes, deterioration of transplants, and also aging. So imagine, you know, um, aging can be considered, you know, from many different aspects, but one of them is actually losing homeostasis, losing, you know, perfect functioning of the different organs. And uh, so deterioration of the control mechanisms uh, include the reactivation of genes that, that should be completely, you know, silent. And this is also why we believe and we understand this concept of, uh, of the development of fibrosis. So, but what is it, fibrosis? Well, it is a, it's a devastating disease that uh, leads to organ failure, can lead to organ failure in the kidney, in the liver, you know, in different organs again. Uh, unfortunately, there is no really a specific treatment that can preserve the function of the, of the organ. And at the cellular level, there are different things that happen. So, um, it is called fibrosis because there is a massive accumulation of fibers of um, extracellular matrix, mainly collagen. And, uh, and there, there are other two components that actually are not there in the slide, but are also very important. So um, the cells, in this case kidney cells, they differentiate so that they are not kidney cells anymore, and therefore they cannot you know, fulfill their function. And there is also a very important inflammatory component. So the reason why we decided to, 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 to work on that was actually, a, you know, Two reasons. One was that uh, we had seen that, you know, the cancer cells behave similarly to the, to the embryonic cells in terms of migration, and I mentioned that already. But we wonder, uh, you know, what would be the response of the reactivation of these developmental genes in the adult, but not in cancer cells, but rather in cells that were not transformed. So that was sort of an intellectual sort of questions that we wanted to answer. So, okay, so, you know, you know, cancer cells can do, but can other cells which are not cancer cells do it? That was the actual first question. But then there was another reason, very important. So you remember maybe that uh, yesterday I told you that uh, the beginning wasn't easy to, um, to sort of, uh, you know, convince many people that uh, 
this embryonic program would be important for tumor progression. Well, the same happened in the nephrology field, or essentially in the, fib in the field of fibrosis, mainly in the kidney. That half of the nephrologists thought that the EMP was very important for the development of fibrosis, thinking that, of course, you know, the epith renal epithelial cells would be converted maybe into this fibroblast, myofibroblast, after undergoing EMT, and therefore fibrosis, you know, EMT would be at the hard core of fibrosis. But half of the field, you know, thought that no, 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 no. These myofibroblasts have a, a completely different origin. They derive mainly from fibroblasts that are interstitial fibroblasts now converted into myofibroblasts that can secrete collagen. And, uh, you know, that was this big debate. And, uh, I mean, I was very difficult. I wasn't involved at the beginning of that, of course. But, but you know, they were sort of, you know, fighting really Mm, you know, very evidently in many meetings. So we thought, well, first of all, we want to know what is the response of a non-cancer adult cell. And second, we want to know whether ENT is really involved in that or not. So, of course, this happened already quite, a, you know, a few years ago. And I will give you what happened, I mean, in just a uh, maximum, a couple of slides. But the conclusion is that, yes, ENT is very important in renal fibrosis but it is a case of partial EMT. So let me know, or let me, let me show you the, um, the, the models that we develop very fast and it's, you know, sort of easy to, 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 to see. So what we did is, um, again, remember, you know, the normal um, epithelial structures in the adult, you know, are, you know, really very well protected and therefore these developmental genes are not activated. The genes that induce EMT are completely silent. So we decided to generate a model in which we could conditionally activate the snail in the renal epithelial cells and see what happens. So we used uh, you know, the standard tamoxifen inducible model for renal epithelial cells. And, 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 and there you have you know, on, the, on the left the normal kidney when snail is not activated and uh, on the right after the snail activation. So the first thing that you see is that these beautiful polygonal epithelial cells don't look like that anymore. And if you look at the other, at the other um, images, this is just a very simple histological staining for collagen. And uh, the more red you see, the more collagen there is, and you see that the morphology of the kidney has changed dramatically, and there is a lot of collagen deposition. So this, and this to us meant that the sole activation of a snail in the renal epithelial cells could lead to fibrosis. And in fact, these mice died of renal failure. So we had all the hallmarks of fibrosis. But then this experiment told us, okay, a snail reactivation is sufficient, but didn't tell us whether snail reactivation was required for the development of fibrosis. So then we um, uh, did, uh, you know, a sort of a complementary experiment. So what we did is we used a very well-known model of uh, renal fibrosis, which is just a unilateral ureteral obstruction. And uh, with that, um, we could, um, you know, really see that snail was activated, as you can see there, you know, in the obstructed kidney. Then we saw that there were a lot of myofibroblasts that you can see there in, in, in brown with, uh, you know, a particular marker, which is uh, smooth muscle actin. And then we also looked at collagen deposition. So you can see this is a very fibrotic kidney. So then we, th we thought, well, okay, let's do the ureteral obstruction in a kidney that cannot reactivate a snail. So this is now very easy to do. So we used a, a Cree line that uh, is, um, again, specific for the renal epithelial cells, and we used a snail flux talil. And this means that even if we do ureteral obstruction, a snail cannot be reactivated. So the control worked. You see a snail was not reactivated, but then you also could see, or I hope that you can see, and we saw, that the number, the population of myofibroblasts was very much diminished, and also that uh, collagen deposition was very highly attenuated, indicated that a snail reactivation was not only sufficient, but it was also required for fibrosis um, uh, to, to, to develop. And, uh, and indeed, uh, you know, now is the question, so what happens? You know, is CMT really crucial for the development of fibrosis? The answer to this question is already, yes, it is. Um, you know, without it, there is not really uh, overt fibrosis. But now the question was, are these myofibroblasts coming from the renal epithelial cells after undergoing EMT? And the answer was no. 
because what we, are, what we could see is that uh, I mentioned already partial EMT. Now I'm going to be talking an, about a different type of partial EMT, which is the following. There you have one um, nice uh, renal epithelial tubule, the healthy one. So then we do you know, either ureteral obstruction or models of toxicity for, for fibrosis. And what we get is snail activation. That, you know, that's OK. But then what happens with these epithelial cells that have activated a snail, and they are not embryonic cells, they are not cancer cells. They are bon, you know, sort of a, um, healthy uh, uh, epithelial cells at the beginning. So what happens is that they undergo this partial EMT that in this particular case is um, the differentiation. So the cells are not renal cells anymore, though, so they cannot do their job. But they do something really very interesting now. They start to secrete different factors. Uh, one is TGF beta. TGF beta is very important. TGF beta indeed is also one activator of EMT, so it goes into, into a positive loop. And what is Crucial for that is that this TGA beta was already known to convert fibroblasts into myofibroblasts. And that explains uh, why you, know, you do not have fibrogenesis without a snail activation in the renal epithelial cells. But even more interesting, or I would say more you know, sort of unexpected, these damaged cells that have undergone this partial EMT would secrete, secrete other cytokines that are you know, sort of inflammatory cytokines that attract macrophages um, you know, from, the, from the bone marrow and indeed promote and maintain inflammation. So essentially, what I'm telling you is that uh, fibrosis is a case of partial EMT. Uh, there is no invasion or delamination, so the cells do not engage into the invasive program. They cannot break down the basement membrane. They stay there, but they are de-differentiated, therefore renal insufficiency. They uh, convert fibroblasts into myofibroblasts, and they promote inflammation, all the hallmarks of fibrosis. So essentially, um, this was indeed confirmed. So which is the origin of the myofibroblasts? A beautiful study uh, you know, showed more recent, I mean, not that long ago, that uh, with beautiful lineage tracing analysis, the cells that uh, are the origin of the myofibroblasts are really the fibroblasts, as we um, uh, had proposed. So, Essentially, EMT, it is important for the development of fibrosis, but if you think about it, you know, 100% of the nephrology community were right, because those who, who thought that EMT was important were right, and those who thought that uh, myofibroblasts do not come from full EMT, from renal epithelial cells, were also right. So, good, <laughs> you know, uh, this sort of so reconciled, you know, oh, what happened in the field. And for us, it was very interesting to see these different types of EMT going on in different contexts. So, remember, we have a partial EMT, which is not invasive, this one, and we have a partial EMT, which is still invasive in development and in cancer. So, with all that, uh, we wanted to actually ask ourselves, uh, you know, more questions. So, first of all, can we better understand the different EMT programs, development, fibrosis, and cancer? Can we, um, you know, find commonalities and or specificities in the different contexts? And also, can we define universal responses? What can we learn after being looking at all these different processes? So we embarked ourselves into a sort of horizontal transversal project looking um, at the same time, neural crest, renal fibrosis, and uh, breast cancer. And this is what we did. So then we, we uh, you know, wanted to look at uh, the three of them and did single cell RNA seq, no surprise, you know, now, <laughs> you know, as we always try to do that because it provides with a lot of information. And what we found is that in the neural crest, the expected thing, I mean, nothing really very new, but we could, um, you know, confirm that. And we found this um, invasive, um, you know, uh, trajectory that was gradual from partial to full EMT. I'm not going to be showing you all the data, but essentially, you know, from the neural tube to the, uh, you know, sort of uh, 
long migratory pathways, you, you are sort of increasing the mesenchymalization. And in fact, the cells that uh, are more mesenchymal are the ones that will be giving rise to the ecto, um, ecto derivatives, like ectomesodermal derivatives, like uh, you know, the uh, craniofacial structures that I was telling you about yesterday. So we did you know, the usual thing, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the UMAPs and the trajectories, and that uh, we you know, found the expected. But then, you know, when we looked at fibrosis, we could also confirm what I told you already. So we are uh, also seeing a non-invasive, a partial EMT, and with a very important component of inflammation. So this is the UMAP for all the different populations in the, in the, in the kidney, and this is the trajectory that we, that we actually found from the differentiated epithelial cells to the differentiation and then, uh, uh, you know, a big component of... Uh, of uh, inflammation. So essentially, uh, the, the, the summary of this, of this part is that, uh, you know, the question that we have, what is the response of an adult non-transformed cell to the reactivation of the developmental program? The, uh, is, it, you know, this is, this is what happens. So we start with the epithelial cell and, you know, hybrid phenotypes and then the mesenchymal phenotype in the embryo. Uh, you know, there is this uh, already very well-known embryonic EMT process. Uh, with invasion and dissemination as the main trait, and this goes for organ formation in development. And then we have this adult program. The adult program is different, so now uh, epithelial cells activate these developmental genes, and they undergo what we call now the adult EMT, and the adult EMT is different from the embryonic EMT, so that we see uh, you know, a, a damage response we see inflammation and we see degeneration and therefore uh, organ fibrosis. Let me tell you that this process can be somehow reversible, but this is as the response of an acute damage. If the damage is a chronic damage, it goes to degeneration rather than repair and uh, the, you know, the progression of organ fibrosis to organ failure. Again, you know there is plasticity going on there. Uh, this is you know, uh, clear. When the cells reach their destination, you know, it is plastic. In this particular case, we can actually force it to be plastic and we have shown, even though I, I don't have it here today, that if we inhibit EMT factors in fibrotic kidneys, uh, we can actually attenuate very significantly fibrosis. So now, um, after knowing that you know, we have one embryonic and one adult program and how they are you know, quite different and the, and the impact on the cells is very different, we wanted to see what happened in cancer. And in order to do that, what we decided to, 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 to look at was breast cancer for several reasons. The first one is that breast cancer is very well studied. Therefore, there is a lot of information and we wanted to have uh, something like that. Then we used a model which is very well known, the PYMT model. So it is, uh, you know, tumorogenesis is induced uh, by a virus. And uh, this is, uh, these mice spontaneously develop uh, tumors and we know the cell of origin. So the idea was to actually follow the trajectories from this cell of origin towards you know, the acquisition of the malignant phenotype and the impact in, in metastasis. So that was, that was the idea. So this is the, the model that we use. So we labeled uh, the epithelial cancer cells with tomatoes so that we can actually follow them. And then, of course, we did, uh, you know, again, the single cell RNA seq, and we looked at, you know, UMAP, and we inferred uh, also trajectories. And we found something like this, which was, I have to tell you, you know, at the beginning, unexpected. We really wanted to analyze what that was, but it was a clear bifurcation. We are looking at EMT programs, right, specifically. There was a, cl a clear bifurcation into different paths, and that you can actually see here how the bifurcation was. So now we have one EMT trajectory, we have two, so EMT1 and EMT2. So what are these? That was, that was the question. So, um, so first, we wanted to analyze uh, you know, these two EMT programs. And so this is EMT1. And as you can see here, we could see that uh, you know, we could find this uh, gradual uh, you know, um, uh, transition towards the mesenchymal phenotype along the trajectory. And you see the terms and the processes that actually came up. Very nice, you know, so my development, uh, you know, mesenchyme development, neural crest. 
Anyway, so all embryonic programs are actually very highly represented in, in the tumors, which is something that we expected because, you know, for many years we, you know, we have been studying and many labs have been studying how the reactivation of the developmental programs can actually impact tumor evolution. And then, uh, you know, we um, managed to have a very interesting signature, which is what we call the pro-invasive signature. And uh, with this uh, signature now, we can we can interrogate ourselves and to sort of predict how invasive they would be. So in this case, you see that uh, for the trajectory one, we are sort of increasing the invasive capacities all along the trajectory. But then, of course, we also wanted to analyze trajectory. So we found this uh, EMT1, which is really, you know, embryonic-like and invasive. So then we wanted to analyze trajectory two. And what is it that we found? We found that the embryonic programs were not really very highly activated. However, we did see a lot of uh, inflammatory pathways being activated. And uh, then when we looked, uh, you know, when we looked at uh, the, the enrichment in the invasive uh, sort of uh, capacity, we see that invasion was not there. So if you remember what I told you before, this trajectory in the tumor is very reminiscent to the adult ENT trajectory that we had just defined in the, in, in the, in the kidney. So then we wanted to sort of, you know, confirm that and we wanted to see, you know, this invasion sort of uh, predicted invasive capacities through the analysis of this signature. And you can see, I mean, this is, this is trajectory one and, and here is trajectory two. So you see that invasion actually goes with trajectory one. Oh, sorry, I think I might also have to put this is easier. So this is trajectory one and this is trajectory two. So you see that invasion is actually activated all along and gradually trajectory one. And you see that trajectory two is actually enriched in inflammation. So this, you know, it really makes sense. And now if we do a hallmark EMT sort of commonalities for the two EMT programs, we can see them activated in both, uh, you know, trajectories. So this was to us already, uh, you know, very interesting. And then, you know, what we found, this is exactly the same as I showed you before, but now if we have cancer, this is what we did. Uh, fine, so cancer cells, they, uh, they can take two different pathways. You know, the, the, the pink pathway, which is for invasion and dissemination, and the blue pathway that it is actually for uh, inflammation. And these two together go to either metastasis or inflammation. But this is, of course, the prediction with the you know, trajectories that we could infer from our single cell RNA-seq data. But we wanted to see whether this is compatible with what we see in the tumors. And the first thing that we wanted to see was to analyze markers specific for trajectory one or trajectory two and see where these cells lie within the tumor. And this is where they are. So uh, in red is um, a marker of, tra of trajectory one, and uh, in, in green, a marker for trajectory two. And you can see how, uh, you know, trajectory one cells are, are um, you know, located in the margins of the tumor, and you see that trajectory one, trajectory two cells uh, are associated with the, you know, center of the tumor. This is compatible with trajectory one cells being engaged into the invasive and the laminating program, and you can see these, uh, you know, sort of red cells already, you know, with uh, phenotypes that are very reminiscent of the uh, invasive phenotype. But then um, for trajectory two, so we wanted to, to, you know, to see, we know already that they are located sort of in the middle of the tumor, not in the, in the, in the edges. But also we could see that they are associated with macrophages by looking at uh, these um, macrophage specific markers. So indeed, again, compatible with, uh, with inflammation. So the conclusion of that is that the EMT in cancer is um, two different EMT programs. It's like a sort of labor distribution, one for you know, dissemination and another population for, for inflammation, uh, representing the activation of the embryonic or the adult program. And uh, so we are really dealing with two independent programs with different functions implemented in segregated populations in individual tumors. But of course, again, up to here, you know, this is what um, you know, single cell um, sequencing transcriptomics tells us. But we really want to know whether this is actually, uh, you know, the, this functional inference that we showed in here 
actually hold true. And uh, in order to do that, uh, we really wanted to do a validation and, uh, and challenge the trajectories. Um, we um, did the validation by multiplex expression analysis, some of which I showed you already. But we also uh, validated the trajectories uh, doing different experiments. For instance, studying um, kidney samples that were obtained at different times after obstruction. So it's like, in, you know, it was pseudo time what I showed you up to now, and this is real time experiments. We also uh, studied in, uh, the tumors uh, at different times, just to provide uh, real time uh, data also. And uh, we did also scenic analysis, which is a way to predict putative gene regulatory networks. And with that, try to validate downstream targets in each of the trajectories. And uh, what we also did, that I will show you now, is start to challenge the trajectories in terms of the EMT by targeting uh, specific factors. So um, we found that you know, in the trajectory one, the one that is similar to the embryo, the one that leads to invasion, and you know, as a first step of, uh, of the metastatic cascade, we found that PRX1 was specific for this trajectory. And we could show that invasion was directly related to the capacity of these cells to invade um, and disseminate. So we decided to, uh, you know, to generate tumors that are deficient in this transcription factor and see what happened. So, the, 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 so we did, uh, you know, uh, again, you know, wanted to challenge this EMT trajectory. Remember, it is embryonic-like and it is invasive, and the, the second one was inflammatory and non-invasive. So what we found is that when we generated tumors, uh, primary tumors, uh, which are deficient for PRX, we could see that you know, invasion at the edges was very, very much reduced. And we also saw that metastatic burden was dramatically reduced. So what you are seeing here are lungs of these mice. And uh, of course, the, 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 the red uh, you know, structures are the metastasis, because remember, the cancer cells were labeled with tomato. And uh, this is, I mean, we used, oh, sorry, we use clarity, which is a very interesting, um, very interesting uh, protocol now that it is very much used in neuroscience to clarify the whole brain. So we did that for the lung. And now it is extremely easy to, uh, you know, to quantify the metastatic burden that you can, I hope you can appreciate there, what happens in the, in the normal tumor and in the tumor in which uh, PRX was not uh, expressed. So they are PRX deficient tumors. So what happens with the, with the trajectories? I will just uh, summarize here and I hope you can see it. So here we are looking at different markers for trajectory one and here markers for trajectory two. So what you have to see is the white bars re um, represent the wild type tumor and the, and the blue bars, the mutant tumor. So I hope that you can see that the clusters going all along the trajectory are actually being decreased in, the, in these uh, mutant um, tumors which was somehow expected because remember I told you that PRX is associated with invasion and invasion was you know, being increased all throughout the trajectory and uh, no invasion, no metastasis led to the truncation of, uh, of this trajectory one. And then um, even though we do not have a, a, a specific transcription factor for trajectory two, we could see that uh, deleting um, this uh, factor specific for trajectory one, we could also affect trajectory two because you see that the markers are increased. So what this means is that there is, a, you know, um, plasticity between these two trajectories. So remember that we have like a Y, right? And a bifurcation. So at the beginning, EMT is activated in the cells and then the cells take one path or another. And what we find is that if we make the tumor deficient in PRX, we truncate trajectory one and then now many more cells are engaged into trajectory two. Um, this you can also see by you know, using a, a marker specific for trajectory two. This is the control tumor and this is the knockout tumor. So there are many more cells that actually engage into trajectory one when tra and trajectory two when trajectory one is uh, truncated. So yes, two trajectories, but the two trajectories seem to be interdependent. That is again telling us a lot about the plasticity of uh, cancer cells that can actually engage into an embryonic or adult uh, like uh, EMT program. So again, uh, this is the, you know, the, the summary. Uh, the embryonic uh, EMT going to invasion and the finally organ formation. 
invasion and dissemination and organ formation, the adult EMT that is, uh, you know, in response to, to, to injury, which is mainly, um, you know, I mean, it will develop in the end fibrosis, but with a big component of inflammation that can go to either repair or, or degeneration. And then in cancer, we have the two trajectories that I already mentioned, one leading to metastasis, the other one maintenance of inflammation, which is also, you know, important for tumor uh, progression. But then in the absence of one transcription factor that is uh, crucial for trajectory one, what we see is truncated uh, EMT, truncated embryonic EMT, trajectory one, so no invasion, no delamination, and an increase in the cells that are engaged into, into trajectory two. So um, with this, you know, I would just like to, to finish thanking you very much. Going back to plasticity, because this means that the cells are still able to actually undertake a, any of the, two, of the two pathways. And I wanted now to um, really acknowledge the work that has been done in the lab by, uh, you know, many people. But particularly, I wanted to acknowledge Halil, who's a very senior postdoc. And he's been, you know, the driving force with this project for quite a few years. <laughs> took us a long time. Uh, these are the bioinformaticians, you know, either in my lab or in, in, in our, you know, uh, another lab in the institute. And a fantastic PhD student who's now looking at the, mut at the mutant tumors, fantastic um, uh, technician in the lab. We cannot live with, without her. He uh, was a PhD student in the lab. Now he is um, um, a postdoc in, in Connie Basler's lab. And, um, and our long-term collaborations that they are, you know, cancer experts, Samparo and Gemma, who now works at the MD Anderson Hospital, and it's a very good connection for us to actually look at clinical samples. And uh, the whole lab is the same picture I showed you yesterday, and thanking again all the institutions and, uh, you know, funding agencies that allow us to continue doing this work. Thank you very much.